Hello to everyone out there listening and welcome to the first season of our brand new Create Podcast. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be exploring the world of the creative industries, the fastest growing industry in the UK today. We're going to be chatting to people within the industry, routes they took to where they are today, and how our education system can keep up with this rapidly growing market. Over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to be speaking with people worldwide and try to see what other countries are doing to achieve the same goal. But before we begin, we would like to pay a special thanks to our sponsors, First Port, for making all of this possible. We look forward to working together over the coming weeks ahead. Welcome to the Create Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Create Podcast. Colin Keegan, a broad talent here, and I hope you're all doing well. And for those who are tuning into this podcast each Thursday, I hope you're enjoying this brand new adventure of ours. Our goal with this Create Podcast is to strip back the curtains and chat to those within the industry to find out what life is like behind the scenes and what decisions are guests made both during their career and beforehand in order to get their career going. Our hope is that anyone listening to the podcast each week can learn from both the mistakes and the successes that our guests talk about throughout their lives and careers to date. And if any one person listening to this podcast decides to take a chance and enter the world of creativity as a result of it, well, then I feel we've succeeded in our job. If you're tuning in each week because you like the show or if you like the artist, you're more than welcome and it's great to have you all on board. We're only a month old here at the Creative Podcast and so far we've had over 2,000 downloads and we've been listened to in over 34 countries across 371 cities in the world, which is phenomenal thank you so so much and please continue to share our episode with family and friends or on social media each thursday as we release our latest episode you can also let us know your thoughts by either emailing us directly at hello at broadtalent.org or you can tweet about us or post about it on facebook or instagram and just make sure to use the hashtag create podcast and since next week is our final episode of season one before christmas what we thought we would do is take a few of those comments that people are making each week and read them out at the beginning of the episode so if you want your comment read out just make sure to use the hashtag create podcast and let us know your thoughts As for today, I am really, really excited about this episode because not only is our guest a very close friend of mine and someone with whom I had the pleasure of touring the world, but he also happens to have an extremely fascinating career to date and I can't wait to talk to him about it. Not only is he the utmost professional, some people might know him as the child star of Celtic Thunder, others might know him as the Irish star of Glee, but to me, he's the only man I know personally that can perform this next song on a 75 city North American tour in a pair of stilettos. Our guest today is Damien McGinty. Like Chloe Agnew last week, Damien joined a major Irish production show, Celtic Thunder, as their child star at only 14 years old. Since then, he has toured the world with Celtic Thunder, embarked on a solo career which saw him win the Glee project and feature on the hit show itself for two seasons before coming back to Celtic Thunder in its current format. I've had the pleasure of touring and working together with Damien and the Celtic Thunder, and now I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome him to episode 7 of our Create podcast. Damien, how are you getting on? Not too bad, Colin. How's it going, buddy? I'm doing great, doing great. Listen, thanks for taking the time out to chat to us. Um, before we start, how's life in LA treating you? How's everything going the last short while? Well, uh, thanks for having me, man. It's a real pleasure to be on. But um, yeah, life's life's good. I mean, considering obviously what the years look like, mm. um, it's, it's to say the least, it's been an anomaly for you know for all of us. Um, but uh, yeah, I've, I've been out here. I haven't been home since last Christmas, so I think that's probably really uh, the most difficult um, thing for me at the minute. Uh, I am going to get home in a few weeks, early January. I get back, so just after Christmas. Um, but apart from that, it's been good. I mean, everybody's healthy. We're all good. We're hanging in there. We're just yeah, you know, yeah. Which I suppose the main thing. Up in indoors, basically. So just I yeah, kind of groundhog day after groundhog day. You know. Yeah, of course. And it, and it's funny. I mean, even from talking to a few mates of mine who are stateside and and you know, kind of used to spending a bit of time away from home. 
they all seem to have the same reaction where you can get used to being away from home, but it's always nice knowing you can get back if you need to. But this this year where you're told you when you can and can't fly home is is you know it's a difficult it's one to try and get used 100%. to. One hundred percent. I mean, there's there's two things from this that I've learned personally on a mm. on a personal level, like the way my life used to has well the way my life has looked up until around you know March when this all started going down was two things that I majorly took for granted was. Um, the idea that I could go home at any point or travel mm-hmm. anywhere at any time. Um, I never thought that that would be something um, that was sort of taken away from me. Um, and then second uh, was the ability to like book a gig at any point. Um, if you yeah. want to go out and book your own show, even if it's for 50 people, 100 people, 500 people, 5,000 people, uh, the ability to just book a show and yeah. go and sing just stay busy. Yeah. a live concert. Um I never thought that like the chance to hustle in that sense either would be all of a sudden taken away from hmm. from musicians, from artists. I think in terms of live music, we're probably past the fifty percent point at least for when hmm. it'll come back. I, I, I sort of think the summer is probably a realistic aim for somewhat um, hmm. at least outdoor festivals and stuff like that. I yeah, think I can yeah. See, see that being reasonable for the summer. So yeah. fingers yeah. crossed. Absolutely, absolutely. And before we dive into the past, Damien, last thing uh, on the last few months, is there anything you've had an opportunity to do that's slightly different to the normal year? Or, you know, have you been able to, I know with Celtic Thunder, obviously you guys have been staying really busy with your online stage of shows. Um, and, and that yeah. in itself has gone in a different direction to what you would typically do, which has been brilliant to watch. Um, yeah. Has it been a time where you've been able to sort of explore other avenues that, that on a normal year to year basis you just it, haven't had time. Yeah, yeah, it has. Man, it's been um, obviously, you know, the main, the main core of what we do is, is you know, is is no longer um, accessible anymore. So yeah. I think, I think me personally, I sort of struggled around March and April um, in the sense yeah. that my entire I had a summer tour set up and that was you know had to be pulled. Um, I was out with Celtic Thunder in the autumn and obviously that had to be pulled. So be, it being pulled early April was like a real... Yeah, uh, that's a long time to be looking at an empty schedule. Like it's, you know what I mean? That's like a full year of like, yeah. how am I going uh, how, how to make a living? How am I going to do yeah. what I want to do? What am I going to chase? Yeah. What are my days going to look like? Just all this stuff was sort of coming tumbling down. And I'm yeah. sure you were the exact same. Everybody across the board. So I yeah. think I, I sort of struggled March and April. Um, but then once I kind of got a grip on it and realized that, all right, this is going to be, this is going to last all year. This is probably going to start into next year as well. Mm. Um, it's important to be, to now become proactive uh, rather than reactive. Um, yeah. And I think, I think that's where as a group, as, so I, I did that as an individual, but then also as a group as Celtic Thunder, we sat down on several Zoom calls. And I mean, you were part of them. You were part of series one and series two, I mm. think. Um, and we sort of came up with this concept of doing these online shows for the fans because you know everybody was almost running out of content back home yeah. like, i don't know about yeah. you but i go on netflix now and there's probably not much i haven't seen yeah, <laughs> I know. Know? yeah, yeah, those, yeah. like those those three or four hours from like 6 p.m every night we were sitting on the sofa you're like right we need something to watch you know what i mean <laughs> yeah. um, it's all research you know, david <laughs> uh, it's unbelievable yeah, so know, um yeah. so we we decided to put these shows together and that's been different um in the sense that it's been content-based um informational uh episodes that we've been doing um yeah about the history of ireland about the history of irish characters about the history of celtic thunder songs um we the series with you we did like best of celtic moments like mm. this type of thing um so we've done four series of that and that's been really nice like that's taken me to nashville it's taken me to a couple of different places where i've been filming and um, yeah it's been content. great to see i mean from the audience perspective even the ones that i wasn't a part of you know it and there's been a few other people that i've spoken to who I, I, I won't name now with this but they were saying that i think from looking at what kelsey thunder are doing i think it's probably one of the best uses of the time that i i can see from many artists because the almost the default thing that you would rely on would be to try and stream some some online show or you know but there's only a certain amount of times you can really do that throughout a year um but this has been something you couldn't really bring what you're doing on tour so it's the only time when you could do something like this it's a really great use of time and great use of of yeah well i that's i appreciate that man it was just um 
yeah, we, we sort of felt like it was a good idea. And then it was always developing as it went on as well. Mm. You know, from series to series, we were thinking, what can our next topics be? And, you know, eventually, again, we were able to become proactive, like rather than reactive and sort of plan ahead. And like, we sort of know a concept for the next one or two series, you know, it's sort of Great. A, a yeah, you time. Should, yeah. So we can focus on making the quality of them better because yep. series one and two were a little more thrown together um, mm. because we didn't, really understand again what we were doing like what uh what if we wanted it to look like long term we were sort of we're also not i yep. can speak for yep. us we're not technologically that in, <laughs> the other. um yeah. like we've got shamo as you know telling us yeah. everything what to do like in the european yeah, he's the magic time. man yeah <laughs> he's the magic man and i mean i'm somehow i'm still the youngest but i'm probably the worst in terms of technology <laughs> I'm not greatly. So, because we just invested in these green screens too, and it was an absolute circus, man, getting the four of us set up with a green screen. It, it took, it almost took a full day. Like, I got, I actually ordered a green screen off of Amazon, right? And I called Shamo, the green screen got here. I called Shamo, I says, Shamo, I've got a problem. I says, this green screen, like, my head's bigger than the green screen. I've got quite a big noggin, like, but my, I was like, my head's bigger than the green screen. And he was like, and he was on his phone. And he was like, right, 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 this is what you have to do. So I was going around the kitchen, man, trying to tie the green screen there. <laughs> then I, got, I, was, I, I took a cushion off the sofa and I tied the cushion to the chair and then I tied the green screen around the cushion <laughs> and the chair to sort of try it, but it just wasn't working. Shamo gets on his phone, right? Uh, how, how close are you to Tuscan, California? There's a store here where I've got it ordered there. All you have to do is go and pick it up. So I was driving around California with Shamo <laughs> here, picking up a green screen to shoot later that day. It was just, it was an absolute. Oh, circus. that's so funny. I mean, this is why so, there's never a dull moment in Celtic Thunder because no, these kind of never. things just happen all the time. Never. If you can see them behind the scenes, I mean, as you know better than anybody yourself, it's just, <laughs> it's a circus at the best of times. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. You could do a show in itself <laughs> of just the behind the scenes yeah. stuff. Yeah. You honestly could you honestly could but no it's been great it's been really great to see what what you've been coming up with um and, and damien i mean something i typically wouldn't tend to do uh obviously yourself and i had chloe agnew last week as our guest as well two people i know very well and you know i mm -hmm. very seldomly would have taken the time in your company to just sit down and talk to you about your sort of life story so to speak and what life was like before yeah. cats thunder at a young age so uh, and, and it's really interesting that you know one of the reasons i want to to try and pair yourself and Chloe one week after the others because your stories would be on the surface anyway quite similar of joining a show of similar Absolutely. stature and being yeah. the youngest members of it um, and a lot of the work that we would do abroad talent would be with teenagers in particular so mm. to talk to someone who had such enormous success during the teenage years is something I'm looking forward to but before yeah. we get to that yeah. if we looked before that which I know was going way way back uh, to early years I mean growing up in Derry was music and was performing something from a young age even though I know you were young when you started but was, before that was it still something that you knew you wanted to get into yeah I mean Colm I never really like I didn't grow up in a in a musical family like I wasn't surrounded by like uh, musical instruments and and you know sometimes mm -hmm. I sort of I sort of wish I was because I know a lot of people are a lot of people who end up being musicians are raised in that kind of background or experience where, you know, their, their granddad would pick up a guitar or their, you know, their granny would yeah. be on the piano or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, I didn't really have that at all. Um, so the only thing that I really understood and was able to sort of make sense of at a very young age was that I love to, to um, imitate artists that I seen on the TV um, and oh, I right. love to go around. So like I used to watch, and I was like five years old, um, I used to watch Stars in the Race, which was a show oh, on yeah. ITV. Um, and the first two people that I would imitate were Chris de Berg, which was 1908. So I was six years old, and I used to sing Lady in Red. That was one of my first songs. Oh, no um, and then after that, was there was a fella that done Freddie Mercury, and he'd, he sung um, It's a Kind of Magic. And yeah. it was phenomenal. Um, and I used to get like a long pole and like go around, the, <laughs> go around the living room pretending to be Freddie Mercury singing. And this is the days when I was like a, a high tenor. I wasn't a baritone singing Freddie Mercury. Yeah. But, um, so I was just like, that, that was sort of the only thing that I was able to like get a grasp on and make sense of. And then I think um, I started singing publicly when I was like, we would go on family holidays every summer. Um, mm -hmm. And that was like my chance to, um, you know, my, my dad would always like almost seek out 
karaoke spots. So like you, you know, in all these European hot spots. Yes, where, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, we nice. have plenty of those ourselves. Yeah. I, let's <laughs> like your it's your salute. It's your whatever it might. It's your band yeah, dorm, yeah. Whatever it might be. Um, I feel like it's the American equivalent of like Destin in Florida. You know, it's where everybody yes. or like Alabama, where people go on a beach holiday for a week. Um, and my dad almost every night would like seek out a specific just like karaoke place with like a competition <laughs> or and my dad enjoyed it as much as I did I mean my as well I mean my mom was always loving it but my dad was the one like my dad would run an hour every morning my dad's a runner so every morning he would get up and he would get a lay of land and actually one of his main things would be I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna sort of you know scout the place and see what sort of karaoke bars we're dealing with here and all this so stuff and like funny. that was <laughs> That was our two-week holiday from since I was about five years old. Um, the first song I ever sung was No Matter What by Boyzone. I remember it very well. Um, and that was when, I know, and I, I definitely, I won that competition, but it was definitely a, a complete sympathy. I was, I mean, I was a vegetable. I can barely talk, never mind sing. Um, <laughs> so, but that was the first time that I sort of got the bug for it. And I was like, maybe I can like carry a tune. That's kind of the only thing I could make sense of. Um, and I just kept singing. Um, and I wanted to get better and I joined any, any chance I could to sing, yeah. come, and whether it be a choir, whether it be a folk group of mats, um, whether it be a, a, a local competition, what, you know, whatever it might be. It's a very, it's a very like small town mindset where people, um, it's, I, I, it's sort of like a steel town, you know, there's that old saying, old steel town where it's like, you, you sort of do the same thing every day. You get up. Yeah, you, of course you, you do. Yeah. Home, go to school, yeah. you do your home, you eat your dinner, you watch a TV Coronation Street or you watch the Champions League and then you get your supper and you do the same thing again. You know what I mean? Yeah, that was right day, yeah. Guy, which yeah. we all love and I pine for sometimes because it's part of it's, it's part of who you are. It's part of your yeah. makeup. Um, yeah. So it wasn't like there was an abundance of opportunities to sing. A but lot. it's amazing though. Uh, sorry to interrupt you now, but it's, it's yeah. amazing to see. I mean, even when you're talking about that, in a way, it doesn't surprise me that it, it you were performing from such a young age not that i was part of the the first show with kathy thunder but even when we were on stage together i mean there's always no matter how much i'd be performing anyway on a personal level there was always a limit to what i felt i could do within my comfort zone if sharon brown our producer asked me to do something that there was some things that i just were absolutely off limits but there didn't seem to be the same boundaries when it came to you <laughs> damien there was just this whatever was the benefit of the audience in front of you you'd go along and and uh you know that is brought you to to whether it's wearing some questionable attires or <laughs> or there's, performing there's but it's been, amazing there's been there's been <laughs> but you've you've always just gone with with whatever is in the benefit of of the audience and just gone with with that showmanship right. it, it, you right. know it's a credit to well, you yeah well i appreciate that man i think i mean i think the best way i can describe it is number one i do i really love it more than anything i've like ever done um and i know every you know everybody says that and i'm sure I'm sure most people mean it but like in terms of i i love a lot of things about I, I love a lot of things about the music industry whether it be creating or whether it be writing or whether it be recording or um but like the time where i really come alive is when i'm on stage and when as soon as the lights come up i'm a completely i'm almost like a different person like i'm, I'm really yeah. not myself that's not you are, the yeah the yeah. bus that's not that's not the day man you talk to on the, you know, on a day on a day to day basis. It's a, it's almost like an alter ego thing. Uh, no, there is. Um, there's two. There's two Damien McGinty's I know anyway, and there's the most <laughs> chilled out, relaxed Damien, off stage. Yeah. You literally, like you know, nothing seems to stress you at all. And yeah. then there's the Damien on stage, which is just you flick a switch and you're you're uh, you're in your element. You really are. Well, I, I I don't really know how to explain that, but I mean, it sort of circles back around to the fact that I would do almost anything on stage in terms of entertainment. And you know, Sharon Brown has obviously been producing that show for 13 years, mm. um, and she's had me do a plethora of things from puppy love to breaking up was hard to do to um bay city rollers where i came out in the you know the, yes. the jeans and, and the heels i was actually in heels and i've done that for 75 cities across North America. <laughs> um and everybody thinks i'm mental but i actually i actually love it um <laughs> and it's very strange I, it, it's i can't really explain it but i do love the show showmanship is the is the perfect word that you, you sort of described and um I love that. I love the presentation of it. And I love being able 
to almost be somebody else and like not worry about yeah, Damien behind the scenes. I'm I'm a yeah. completely different character now. I'm a completely this is a you know, it's almost you look at somebody like uh like Lady Gaga, right? Like Lady Gaga's yeah. actually a stage name. Yeah. Um, yeah. and that's not her at all. Now obviously nowhere near the lengths of what she would do on stage, but it's a certain thing. It's a certain uh, similar thing. In, yeah, in I get you. Yeah, on yeah. On stage, just being somebody totally different. Yeah, you know? and and you, so you mentioned Puppy Love there. I mean, even from a young age, were you phased, or you were fourteen at Puppy Love? Were you? I was fourteen. I just changed my camera there. I hope that's all right. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, I was, I was. I was fourteen. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I can't sit here and say I wasn't phased because you know I was definitely. Um, I wouldn't say on edge, but just like so fresh, yeah. so new to it all. It's probably like. I mean, you, you know, you kind of, I, I think you're a bit different where you sort of edged your way in. Like, you know, you were touring with Celtic Woman for a while. Um, mm. So you were doing professional things. You were performing in huge venues across the world already before you, you know, became a principal. <laughs> Celtic Thunder. Yeah, um, you would think that that would have helped in some way when joining Celtic Thunder. But <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just, I'm just sort of guessing that it is. <laughs> no, you're right. You're I don't right. know, but I mean, nothing will prepare you or prepare you for the Celtic Thunder experience, but um, <laughs> especially off stage. Yeah, but, exactly. No, I think for as a 14 year old, it was really getting pulled out of school was my number one priority because I really hated it. Um, and then once that happened, uh, it was excitement, but it was a mixture of adrenaline. And again, it was a mixture of that, the same thing that hasn't changed. There's that just there's that thing inside of me that hasn't changed, which is almost that like unpredictability where as soon as it's shoe time, <laughs> it's a different person. And I, I actually had that when I was 14 as well. Um mm. and it, it came along with nerves. But I think in a sense, Cobb, it's kind of weird. Like when you're 14, it's almost easier because you don't understand the magnitude of what you're doing. Mm. Um yeah, that's interesting. You know, like, yeah. there's not as much. You think there's more pressure on you because oh, they've hired a 14 year old. That's brave, but really, you're 14. There's not an awful lot expected from you. So, yeah, I never thought about it from that point of view. There would certainly be if you compare, say, your position to someone like George Donaldson in the show, who had, you know was married with a daughter at that stage. Yeah, <clears throat> and absolute worst case scenario is you don't put in a great performance and people go, "Oh, he's he's only 14." Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so true. Like, really, yeah. the pressure in in some sense is sort of off. Whereas now the pressure's on a lot more because you, you've got a reputation. You've got four, I've got fourteen years behind me. I've got mm. um, a level of quality that the people are expecting. You know, there's there's different things now that you sort of have to deal with. Whereas when you're fourteen, you're not you're not thinking about you're literally not thinking about anything else at all. Apart, yeah, from that's interesting. Yeah. Stage. You know? But then what's interesting is that I, what what made it so successful and what made the marriage of, of you as a 14-year-old with Celtic Thunder and the success that that show was about to, to embark on was the fact that you, even at the age of 14, whether it was subconscious, whether it was intentional, but you approached the show in the same way you would now, which is just you just gave it everything. And the reason that a, a number like Puppy Love still now is a video that I'm sure people still look at and think that's brilliant is because from such a young age, you didn't turn around on stage and say, oh, listen, I'm new to this. You just went for it. And what I love about even watching that performance now um, is that you're standing on stage in Dublin shooting this show with no knowledge of what is about to come. And yet the response from the audience after the first line of Puppy Love is just an indication of what your life was about to become. And they called it Puppy Love. Take away my only dream 
I was I was able to understand the fourteen that um, even though I did not understand the magnitude of it, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, I did realize that I was incredibly fortunate, um, and I did realize that zero point one percent, if even, of people get to do and get this sort of opportunity. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of cash money too. Um, I did. Whose idea was it for you to to join the show or to audition for it? Well, I um, I did. I went into one of those local competitions I was telling you about. Um, mm. It was actually kind of a funny story. I went in. There was a restaurant around the corner called Rafters. Um, and again, it was a Tuesday night. It was just any excuse, looking for an excuse to sing. I was about thirteen, just mm. looking for an excuse to sing. Um, and my dad, of course, my, my dad found this competition literally three minutes away from the house. But we turned up, man, and it was me and one hour fella. He was like, <laughs> he was also like thirteen. And I remember, and my sister was there as well. And I remember looking at my dad, my sister being like, "We can't. I'm not. I'm not going up against one fella." I says, "We have to go." And, and the bar was empty. Like there was nobody there. You know what I mean? You know, one hour. And I was like, it just felt off. I was like, there's no way. Number one, they're not even going to pick a winner for this because that's just yeah. lousy. That's just not very nice. Uh, your man's better than your man. There, well, blah, 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 go home. Do you know what I mean? Like it's just it's grim. Um, <laughs> But so I was actually an advocate for the one time only for going home. I was like, let's just go home. I, I really, really don't want to do this. And my dad was like, just, just stay. Let's just stay. So my dad and my sister like made me stay essentially. Um, and I ended up winning the competition. But man, I, I won that competition. And because I won it, I got to record um, a 14 track amateur, very amateur record with like backing tracks that I downloaded online. You know, that sort of album. Sure. At a local studio at, at the Blast Furnace in Derry. And that's actually the track. That's actually the 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 demo album that um, family friend Jim Roddy gave to Phil Holder. And then oh, right. Phil, Phil rang my dad saying, "Listen, he says I get dozens of albums every day on my desk." And he's like, yeah. "Normally, he's like normally I, to be honest, he says I don't have time to listen to them all." He says, "But I seen it was from Jim Roddy, and I thought Jim will be following up with me, and he'd be asking what did I think and all this." And he says, but I played the first track and he says, I'll listen to all 14. And he says, and he says, he's talking to my dad. My dad's called Damien as well. And he says, Damien, I have no idea what I'm going to do with your son, but put him on ice. I'm going to do something. Um, so then when the conversation six months later with Phil and Sharon came around about Celtic Thunder, it was called, it was actually Celtic Man at the time. Yes. Um, uh, Sharon says, right, we need five, five principles. And Phil says, we need four. I've got one. No so, way. Yeah, so I mean, I, from then I still had to like go and prove myself and like meet Sharon and, and technically audition, you know. But it was yes, more off. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was more yours off, to lose. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Like the way I wouldn't have got it was that your man's not good enough. Um, yeah. So, which was kind of nerve wracking in itself because I was yeah, of you, course. This chance is waiting for me. I just need to make sure I do my bit. <laughs> so you get the job. Then the show becomes this international sensation. Um, how do you? deal with the level of success that came your way with Celtic Thunder because I mean if you're looking at everyone who was involved in the project from day one the journey that you in particular have been on has to be the most contrasting to where you were from a 14 year old to the very deep voice you have now but also your accent (laughs) (laughs) you know you you now said like you're from the Los Angeles part of Derry City (laughs) But with that success that you had, what was that like as a 14-year-old going through all of those motions? Uh, very unexpected. Um, but I think for some reason, Colm, and I, I always feel like, you know, whenever I talk about this, I always feel like I can't really take credit for this because um, my parents raised me. They, they sort of taught me everything I know. So any way that I react to things or understand things or take things on board or whatever it might be, um, I learned it from the surroundings that I grew up in, from how I was raised, from the morals that were built into me. Um, mm. So to be honest, when CT sort of lit and caught caught fire, um, it never I never had a moment where I felt like almost special or I never had a moment where I felt um, anything other than I just love this job. Um, I feel very fortunate to do this job. Um, I never took it for granted. I was always kind of, I was, I was always just kind of like, I, I love working with the boys. I think a part where I struggled, um, was the idea that I was, well, you know, I started doing the 
the project on the show when I was 14, but I started touring when I just turned 16. Um, 16 is an awkward age because mm. yeah, it's a difficult stage it's, to it's start a touring. Your, it's a way well, it's, it's a part in your life where you're, I was becoming who I am now. Do you know what I mean? That was the very yeah. early stages yeah. of, um, and I was also last in school to hit puberty. So I just started hitting puberty when I honestly, like when I recorded Poppy Love, I was three weeks away from being 15 years old. And yeah. It doesn't look like it. <laughs> that wee fella does not look almost 15 years old. You could say he sounds old, but he looks 10 or 11 almost. Mm. Um, so when I started touring, I just turned 16 and I was really in the middle of totally changing as a human being, as a person. Yeah. I was so awkward. I had acne. I was uncomfortable. I was um, all those things. I, I couldn't sing the songs that I'd sung 18 months previously anymore which was really uncomfortable for a first tour of North America. Yeah, of course. So I really had to, at times, hold on to the core of, this is what I'm meant to be doing. I know I'm going to come through this. Nobody ever prepared me for this. I don't know what, what your experience of sort of changing as a performer, your voice changing, mm. all those things. I, I don't know what that was like for yourself, but it's not something that anybody ever, ever warned you about growing yeah. up. Yeah, that's not what I had. No, it's a really good point. Uh, I think it's an industry that you have to love, you know, even by the sheer nature of of doing, as you say, a 75 city tour, you know, most recently for you guys was if you didn't love what you're doing by show one, how are you going to do that 75 times? Absolutely. So there was was a lot of clinging to the core on that in the sense of this is what I'm meant to do. Um, This is just a very hard, hard period right now. And really that should have been a period where I was lapping it all up and enjoying it the most I've ever done. Cause we yeah, that's it. interesting though, yeah. We were, we were playing Radio City, we were playing the, the, the Nokia Theatre in Los Angeles, we were playing yeah. 8,000 people every night. God, they were yeah, huge numbers. numbers. Yeah. And was that more of a first tour thing, Damien? If you could separate your your early years of Celtic Thunder as chapter one and, and, and then your return as chapter two later, was this a feeling that you had throughout a lot of your chapter one or was it just primarily the first tour? Uh, initial feelings sort of progressing through it the three or four years because I was there from 14 to 18. Um, mm. And, you know, I have actually, you know, you, you mentioned Chloe, I, I have had conversations with Chloe about this as well because we've had very, you know, similar experiences um, yeah. in the early stages of our careers. Um, and Chloe was the example that I was given um, in terms of what this is going to look like for you, you know, in terms of what school is going to look like, in terms of yeah. travel, and you know, in terms of all this, um, Chloe was the was was the was the example of what I was sort of made to look at, um, and she she did really great as well. She, I mean, Chloe's amazing. We all we all know her and love her. Um, mm. So she came out the other end okay. So that was definitely something that I was like, the, the you know, the idea and the stencil of her model was something that I was made to sort of study at, at a young age. Um, but yeah, from 14 to 18, um, there was awkward moments. There was also amazing moments. Not all of it was, of course, that. It was yeah. before the first her. The first her, I was doing material that I no longer was. I was doing Puppy Love. I was doing Young Love. I was doing all these things that that, that simply, that was a performer. It was very strange. It was a performer from 18 months ago and it wasn't me anymore mm. um, because I was turning into a man in front of, of course, thousands, yeah, of, thousands yeah. of people. <laughs> Yeah, I know it is. It's interesting because, I mean, they are, as you point out, they are extremely vulnerable times. And, yeah. you know, to have that level of, of not even success, but level of attention yeah. at, at those times yeah. is, oh. is something I, I've never really considered uh, on your behalf. But I can imagine that being very difficult. But I mean, that's why I think I think that's actually that's why I've enjoyed almost chapter two. That's why I've enjoyed it yeah. as much as I have because mm. it's an experience now that I always knew I was grateful for. I always knew I was lucky to have, but now it's an experience where um, I'm fully developed as a human being. Um, I've got my morals in place. Um, I know who I am as a performer. All these things are now sort of in place for me um, as, as Damien. So to be able to go, to go back and enjoy chapter two and sort of appreciate it for what it is and be fully comfortable. I was always comfortable in my own skin in the early days. Like I, I personally, I've been fortunate enough to never be dealt a hand of feeling uncomfortable in my old skin. Like that's not something I've ever really struggled with. Um, okay. It yeah. It's more of a transitioning thing that was just tough to sort of deal with. Um, but yeah, of course. It's totally different and it's been, um, 
a different experience in the sense of just able to enjoy and appreciate every single minute of it. You know, it's great. I mean, it's great that you, you've you've had that, and and you know that's something I want to talk about in a short bit as well. But before that, I mean, the in between chapter one and two of Celtic Thunder, which in itself is a is a uh, you know a, a massive uh, platform to be working with a show of, of that stature. But to go from that into glee is again i mean you're skipping a few chapters there uh when did the idea of of participating in the glee project come about and when did that idea become a reality uh the idea of the glee project came about in sort of true damien fashion where i was just doing my homework um in the sunroom in Derry, and there was this Mm. online audition and i didn't ask anybody i didn't have anybody to help me i recorded it on my laptop and i stuck it up online um and six months later i got a phone call <laughs> no way <laughs> just like Fair that God. um that was literally that simple um, <laughs> okay. so it obviously got a lot more complicated from there but in the, in terms of it like there wasn't really a lot of thought given to it i just realized that i was enjoying season one of glee um it had started airing back home and i, I thought it was fresh i thought it was just naturally something lovely yeah. to be a part of um but if you hadn't said that to anybody, they would have laughed you off the stage. I mean, of course you'd love to be a part of it. Anybody would love to be a part of the biggest, you know, musical TV <laughs> show probably ever. Well, what this is it because you you sometimes forget because it's no longer on oh. that just how massive Man. it was. It was huge. Lee was a, uh, you know, everything I've been saying previously about um, being raised in the right way and no matter no matter how well centered you are as a person, the juggernaut of Glee would have affected anybody. Um, it was mm. the biggest animal, the biggest mechanical functioning beast um, that I'd ever come across in my entire life. And I just happened to be, you know, a, a big part of it for about two years, two and a half years. I was a part of that world. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was insanity at the best of times. It really, really was. And it was very, very difficult to, at any point in time, get a gist of what you were doing, um, get a gist of the... Okay size of it you know i've always been reluctant to use terms like fame or something and we're so blessed all of us in celtic thunder to have the followers that we do have um but what's great about the level of celtic thunder is that when you go inside the bubble or you go to the theater of celtic thunder there's there's followers of it and you get asked for pictures and signing autographs and and you you know it's we get a, a kick out of that just like anyone else and then when you go beyond the theaters you're sort of back to your yeah anonymous self um going to glee then i mean that is a different ball game altogether that the, that's one of these global machines that the likes of one direction would be another one on that scale that's hard to even get your head around just how massive that is i mean could anything prepare you for that and oh. did the the early start into a show like celtic thunder in any way serve as a as a useful tool and how to deal with it glee and celtic thunder were you, they couldn't be more different um, mm. in almost every, every sense. Um, right, okay. Celtic Thunder was and is a community, yeah. number one. Um, Glee is not. Glee was not. Um, I didn't okay, have right. a team to fall back on. I didn't have you boys to fall back on. You're, you're isolated, mm. stand alone, out on your own, just moved to California. Each Can't man for himself. Each man to himself, living in New York, and it's not a clue where you are going to set every day uh fighting your own fight literally as cold as that like oh my god whereas celtic thunder is a community celtic thunder almost as it, it's it's a community as a as a as a working group you know we we love and know everybody on the road that we work with and um, we really enjoy yeah. working with each other we we lean on each other sometimes yeah of course none of that existed in the world of glee um so it was very very different in that sense also, you know, I, I really don't like the word fame either, but I mean, what I would say is that it was a, it was a very, very different experience um, after even during Glee Project. Like Glee Project was, was also, also was like, it was, it didn't have the ratings Glee had, but it was like, it had a cult following. Oh, right. Of a few million people that was, wow, that were James. obsessed with the Glee Project. And I actually, looking back, I don't blame them. I thought the Glee Project was a better show than Glee, to be honest. Oh, um, really? I, yeah. I, I enjoyed being on the Glee Project more than I liked being on Glee, uh, which was wow, kind of that's ironic. interesting, yeah. But the fame started with that. So the Glee Project is sort of like a like a like an American Idol or Pop Idol or X Factor yeah, type a, a wee environment, bit, Yeah, it? It, was, it was a bit different. 40,000 people, 40,000 kids 
late teens, early 20s went into it. Um, yeah. They made a top 100 out of that top 80 where we went to boot camps. We met, you know, the creators of Glee, the producers of Glee, auditioned, kept going. And then top 12, which I made top 12, my visa came through like the last hour. Oh. That's going to be deep. I was so close to, I was, I mean, my life would have been so different. Yeah, of course. Um, but the Barbara, the visa came through at the last hour. The last hour. I actually hour. had a conversation with Robert Ulrich, who's the main casting director. I had already been to the top 40 boot camp and Robert says, I'm not sending your tape to Ryan. I don't want to waste his time. So we're just sending 39 tapes. We're not sending 40. And I was like, Robert, I was like, this was Friday. And I was on a cruise. Um, I was on Phil Colder's cruise. And I says, Robert, please, we're just waiting on this visa. I says, please give me the Monday morning. And I says, deadline Monday morning, 10 a.m. And man, the visa came through at about half nine. No word of oh, life. Oh I, my I, God. Oh, half nine Monday morning. Half nine Monday morning. Oh my, my life. God. Unbelievable. So, so yeah, and then they made a TV show out of the top 12 where essentially it was all pre-filmed. It was a boot camp in the mountains in California. Um, sure. One person went home every week. And I, I still to this day have no idea how I want it, but uh, <laughs> there's just a, there's, there's, there's a bit of cowboy in every Irishman. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I get a testify to that. And, uh, <laughs> It, it, it was amazing. I mean, I, I obviously joined Celtic Thunder as you were part of Glee. Um, and yeah. to be honest with you, Damien, I mean, most of the times I told people back home that I was part of the show Celtic Thunder, the, the 90% of the reactions I got was, is that the show with your man from Glee? <laughs> you know, so it, it really was, uh, was everywhere. But uh, were you at that stage chronologically, were you living in LA at that point or, or was that what uh, brought that you to LA? That's brought me to LA. So when in that, as soon as I won that show, I okay. won that show in April of, I uh, forget which year, but April. And then um, the show was airing June through August. So that was actually a really fun experience when I had already known before it hit the press, before the show was announced. I had already known I was the winner. So oh, brilliant. I, so I was watching 10 weeks of episodes knowing that I had already Yeah, won. so you just um, got to sit back and, and just enjoy the whole thing. The part of that is you're contracted to the hills and if it gets out, you're fined like 300 million quid or something where you're... <laughs> oh, you're right, okay. You're essentially that's just a that's it's our weekly wage in Celtic Thunder, but I was gonna say, I mean, you make that up in a week, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, that's a joke, but uh, <laughs> just to clarify, I know, yeah, you want to be on tour to be a... you're, you're basically changing your name for life if you're fine, that. um, <laughs> but uh, but that was actually a fun experience, sort of knowing that I'd already won and you know, this was Aaron on a week to week basis, yeah. Um, and then I moved to LA in August and started shooting in September. So it was pretty quick turnaround. God, that is quick, yeah. But I mean, it was absolutely brilliant seeing you on the show and and going through the experience. And I know from the Celtic Thunder side of things, there was just a massive buzz around the place when you were part of Glee. Uh, from be it from cast, crew, or followers of the show, I think the overriding feeling was just everyone was so proud of of what you were doing. What was it like coming back to Celtic Thunder then after that? I mean, did you feel, was it strange in some ways coming back? Uh, or did you feel like it was coming back home in some respects? Um, and did you feel that what you had learned from your time in Glee made you yeah. a totally different You know, performer? man, it was, it was really, really great. Um, I mm. really, really loved it. And I'll tell you why. Because, you know, here's the thing. Like, opinions, you know, everybody has an opinion right and anybody can say mm. and i've got a lot of let's say opinionated people as to like what my career should look like or what i should be doing or what you know this that or the other um i've probably got that more than what like people realize um and going back to kelly thunder like there's some people being like i don't really understand why you're doing this and for me the reason i've done you know, not to sound pompous, but the reason I've done so many things in my career is because I do it because I love it. Brilliant. Number one, that is the core of it for me, not to not to chase fame, not to chase things that I don't want to do, but they're high mm. profile. 
Like there's things I've said no to. There's so many things I've said no to that a lot of people don't know about just because I didn't feel like it was for me. Um, yeah. I didn't fancy it. And it might have been massive, but that, that's, I've had, I've already had the feeling of massive through Glee and I didn't like it. It didn't bring me, yeah. it didn't bring me contentment. It didn't bring me happiness. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah. I was actually able to get so many steps ahead of so many people in the sense that I was fully aware that for me to be happy and for me to be content and for me to find peace in my career, I, I had to do what I loved doing, number one, no matter what level that is. Obviously, you want to do it at a certain level and you want to be as big as you can in the sense of now that looks different for me than what I maybe thought it would look like. Um, but going back to Celtic Thunder was amazing. As I said, I sort of felt I was out of the glee bubble for a year. You know, as I remember Sharon, Sharon called me and really, 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 really tried hard um, to get me on mythology, uh, which was the, the, the film that I so I, oh, yeah. I wasn't a part of mythology. But we had so many conversations and I just felt like it wasn't the right time because yeah. it was in the middle slash towards the end of Glee for me. And I just like, number one, I felt burnt out. But number two, it just sort of felt like a time to take a bit of a step back and like breathe. Yeah, of course. Yeah. See what would develop from here. So then I like took a year or two and then eventually I was like, right, I, I know what I want. Um, and then that was the first tour we did together, which was, I think the very best of tour, um, in 2015 oh, yes. or 2016 or something. Yeah. 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 Um, and I loved it and I loved every minute of it and I've loved it since, um, it's felt like a complete rebirth in terms of my Celtic Thunder experiences. Um, and yeah, I mean, if Glee's taught me anything, it's that, I mean, the only thing that, and like, I did really enjoy the experience and I learned a lot and there was mm -hmm. moments that were phenomenal that I was so yeah, fortunate of course. to yeah. experience. But if it taught me anything, it's that you'll, you'll never find contentment in the size of things. And that is a fact. There will always be something else to chase. There'll always be something else to go after because you think it's going to bring you contentment. And it, it, I'll tell you, it won't, you know. Well, it's great you say that because that's been, that's been mentioned a few times on this short podcast series to date. You know, people saying if you're chasing things like the two examples have been either likes online yeah. slash followers online or money. I mean, if you're choosing and chasing either of those things, there's always more that you can get regardless of what stature you're at or status you're at. There's no so, feeling. There's never, yeah. there's never a ceiling. It's like, and it's, it's just like anything. It's like in your life, right? If you make, if you make 10 million a year, not a lot of people do minority. Maybe I don't even know how many people in the, in the world make that, but you can be sure those people want to make 20 million a year. If you yeah. make 10 grand yeah. a year, you want to make 20 grand a year. It's all ratio. Yeah. It's all what you're used to. It's yeah. all your own normality. It's all what you've normalized in your own head that for somebody else is a mind blowing numerical yeah no you're right you're absolutely right you know yeah but it's all it's all on perspective of the of that actual person's experience so yeah and did you find then when you were because you've done a lot of acting as well did you find because you're such a showman and you have that instant appraisal of an audience that you're performing in front of is that not really different to then go onto a set and not have an audience yeah. that you're performing too i mean what what was that like for somebody who seems so at home on a stage that's actually a really good question because that's that's tough um that's i feel like not a lot of people talk about that um i am the sort of performer where it's weird in the sense of like my wife for example right anna claire um mm. she sees me on a day-to-day -day basis and she knows my career and like loves my career and all this stuff but we can never, I've never like really been able to like figure this out, like how I can be so bang average just sitting in the living room. But then as soon as I go, that's true. But then as soon as I go on stage, it's like, it's a completely different story. Like it is, yeah. it is that switch we spoke about earlier. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can't explain it. I truly can't explain it. And that's, that's a difficulty that sometimes I have on set is that exactly what you're talking about is there not really, there is that light where it says, you know, you know, action, that's okay. Yeah. Oh. And it's not, it's not so bad, but it's not the same as an audience and all right, two yeah. hours of high adrenaline of high performance yeah. of as soon as it's over, you're done, you can come down. And is there anything you do to try and, and counteract that? Or is it just practice, practice, practice? Practice. Mm. Absolute practice. Just work ethic, man. I always think that, you know, I've always, you know, a lot of people talk about like talent and stuff. And for me, I find that 
the most successful people I know are the hardest workers I know. Um, mm. They're also very talented people. Don't get me wrong. Um, and I yeah, it's I've, a combination, really. I, it is a combination, and I think I'm fortunate in that um, I've been dealt a really, really strong work ethic. I love working hard. That's something that I love to do. It's something I strive to do. It's something that I feel um, when I when I don't do it, I feel. Uh, like mm. a lesser version of myself like it's part of my it's great part of who I am. to start wrapping up damien i mean it's it's been absolutely brilliant having you on the podcast and thanks so much yeah, for taking out great. the time yeah, thanks for having me it's been great uh for nothing damien it's been great you've done a, a huge amount already in your career to date so you've done a lot of performing on stage you've done a lot of acting you've done a lot of songwriting now is there any of those three that you feel is your natural home or do you just enjoy balancing all three plates at the same time you know i do love balancing um balancing the plates as you say I, I do really enjoy that um because i think i often think that when you take a slight break from one thing to focus on the other it can refresh the thing you've been mm. taking a break from um especially when it comes to songwriting right i mean for example so i started writing songs learning the crap not writing songs i started writing terrible songs um <laughs> when i was about 21 years old um really really just like not good songs but that's, that's <laughs> well it's a start, of, start yeah you know? exactly that, yeah I, yep. sort of, I was very aware of that and i did this almost like a three or four year workshop in los angeles we're calling where i was going from producer to producer songwriter to songwriter studio to studio just learn the craft um yeah of songwriting because i wasn't thinking about releasing an album i wasn't thinking about releasing songs i was just thinking i want to there are people out there that have dedicated a full life to this. I'm not going to be pompous enough to assume that because I can sing and act that I can write a song because I couldn't. That was the reality yeah. of it. And I knew that, but I knew it was something that I could get good at. Um, so I've really spent a lot of time recently diving into that. And it's something I feel very passionate about now. It's something that I am very, very driven. And I do on a weekly basis at this point. Wow. Um, I want to get better at, and I've got a big plan for next year where, you know, for example, as I was sort of saying the earlier March and April, where everything was so reactive, mm. I was able for, I was able to sort of take, take a seat back and create a proactive plan. Um, and I've done that for next year where basically I'm going to be releasing something, um, every single month. No way. Uh, songs that I'm going to be creating. No way. Songs have been created last year. Yeah, a bit of songs that I'm going to create as I go as well, write as I go. And that's that's a huge challenge. Yeah, it certainly but is. Yeah, but that's brilliant. I'm, I'm starting to build like a really strong following on my original music on Spotify and Apple Great. Music. Yeah. Um, all those things. There's, you know, there's the, the, the numbers are quite encouraging. Um, brilliant. So for me, I want to get better. Um, and I just yep. want my music to grow at this point. You really want to jump books to the So I would say I'm most passionate about that at the moment, but that's because I can't get on stage right now. So it'll, yeah, it'll always be yeah. stage. Like, as you know me, you know, as much as, as much as some of my best buddies out there, it will always be stage for me. Um, yeah. That will always be number one. That's where I feel at home. That's what I miss the most more than anything. Back then has always been a way of, of if an opportunity comes around where I, I feel like it's right for the project and it's right for me, then it's something that yes, I enjoy, I made a film, Santa Fake, that I loved um, because it was a role that was really, really good for me. It was mm -hmm. also, it was very different than Glee because Glee, I played a bit part role. I was in the choir room. Santa Fake, again, this thing of the light turning on and the, the I was the lead in Santa Fake. So all of a sudden, all this pressure was on me and I was able to- It's totally perform, different. I was able to perform so much better because it was like yeah. all the pressure was fully on me. And I just, I'm very weird like that when pressure's on. I really enjoy it. 
So, Damien, you're an absolute star. It's been a pleasure having Thanks you on board. Thanks for having me on. And let's, uh, I know. Let's, let's get back on stage soon. Absolutely. Let's Here's hoping it's sooner rather than later. Um, and uh, well, the fly, the fly next March. There is, yes, the fly. Yeah, absolutely. In March, yeah. And we're going to be hosting uh, an online Irish festival. This is, I mean, it's one of a kind, really. I mean, yeah. I can't really think of anything else that has compacted so many Irish things into an online festival. It's yeah. all things Irish uh, going to be going on on sale. Uh, sorry, it is on sale now, but it's going to be going on so onto the I, screens uh, um, in March, week. the week of St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. So if anyone fancies joining myself and Damien and the rest of Celtic Thunder and, uh, you know, to celebrate pretty much all things Irish in this yeah. festival, uh, everything you can think of is going to be there in a five day, over 60 events. Uh, you can purchase a ticket now for that Wild Atlantic Flab. So it'll be great and it'll be great to catch you whenever you're back over. Um, but best of luck with everything in in the meantime and i would like to also claim a bit of credit actually i should point out to your chapter two in Celtic Thunder. now that i think about it actually um which i forgot <laughs> where, where, you going <laughs> where <laughs> you know when i joined the show Celtic Thunder, they were trying to find songs that would fit my my voice range and, and it seemed like we had a similar voice range as well you know that i like to remind the, the Celtic Thunder followers that i was keeping a lot of your songs and your role warm in your absence, Damien, oh, that you well, just slap back that's, in. It's you know, funny, is... funny that because my first impression of you was, who's that cowboy singing my songs? <laughs> <laughs> Damien, listen, I know you've been meeting now. Thanks for taking the time out. It's been great to chat and I'll chat to you again shortly. All the best. Calls. All right, take Jesus, it easy. Man. See you, pal. Bye, bye-bye. Well, a massive, massive thanks to Damien for taking the time out to join us on the Create Podcast and talk about his career to date. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode seven from season one of our Create Podcast. And one of the things I've loved about this series so far is hearing the journey that each of our guests have been on, the similarities between a lot of what they talk about and the differences as well across the different fields. But one similarity has to be the work ethic that I think everyone has spoken about so far, about putting in the hours, working harder than anyone else to get to where you want to be. And Damien again spoke about that in a nutshell. We will be releasing an episode every Thursday between now and Christmas. And next week is our final episode of season one. Join us next Thursday, the 17th of December for our final episode of season one. And like every other episode in this season to date, you can listen to it on Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon, or any of the usual podcasting platforms. If you like our content, please do let us know. Email us at hello at broadtalent.org or as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, you can share on social media. Just make sure to use that hashtag create podcast. As a reminder, if you would like to feature on our final episode next week, make sure to use hashtag create podcast and let us know your thoughts. See you then, folks.